I'm a chain home builder as well. There is an American TV entrepreneur known as Madman Mumps. His sets were popular and sold at low prices. The reason for that was his TVs were internally very simple, using fewer parts than their rivals. He would reputedly cut components out of sets on the production line, and as soon as the TV stopped working, he'd put the last part that he removed back. In a similar spirit, I present this simple phasing SSB transceiver. The transceiver puts out around 400 milliwatts of SSB on 7 megahertz. I've previously described a similar transceiver which had seven transistors. There's a link to it below. This one is even simpler. Just five transistors and one IC. Hard to believe, but that's all you need to make an operational SSB transceiver on 7 MHz. Based on the SP5AHT design, I've made a few economies to snip some components out. I'll go through the circuit stage by stage and explain how I was able to save on the parts. First of all, the audio stage. SP5AHT used discrete components, with the microphone and receive audio stages being separate transistors that were only used in transmit and receive respectively. I've substituted an IC and LM386 and made that IC active on both transmit and receive with a bit of extra switching. That switching switches the input of the audio amplifier between either the microphone on transmit or on receive the output coming from the audio phase shift circuit. The output of the LM386 on transmit goes to the input of the audio phase shift circuit and on receive to a pair of headphones or speaker. Here's the audio phase splitter circuit. On transmit it takes the audio from the LM386 and splits it into two audio signals identical except for one being 90 degrees out of phase to the other. On receive it's reverse. It takes the 90 degrees out of phase signals and combines it into one signal providing single signal reception. The balance modulator and product detector, like in the SP5AHT circuit, work on both transmit and receive. And I've left the RF phase shift circuit much the same. A 150 PF capacitor in series with a 500 ohm trim pot. Another area where I haven't greatly simplified things is the local oscillator. That uses a ceramic resonator either 7.2 or 7.16 MHz. I could have cut that down to one transistor, but that would mean that the ceramic resonator would pull on the modulation peaks, and there might not have been enough output to drive the product detector and balance modulator. So I've kept it to two transistors. If you don't want the variable capacitor, because the tuning is too finicky, you can substitute a variable resistor and some diodes operating as veractors. In this circuit, one 1N4007 gives you 7.085 to 7.125 with a 7.160 meg ceramic resonator. Or putting in three diodes instead of one gives you a lower frequency range, 7.044 to 7.085. Because they are smaller tuning ranges, it's easier to tune with a potentiometer without a vernier reduction drive. Although the downside is, the variable capacitor will give you a bigger tuning range, mainly because of its lower minimum capacitance. The local oscillator is a BC548 and an MPF102, operating as the buffer. It can be crystal controlled, though I used a ceramic resonator to provide frequency agility. Another area where you could potentially save components is the receiver RF amplifier. If you're building this rig for 80 or 160 meters, you might be able to get away without it, especially if you modified the LM386 circuit to produce more audio gain. I thought that was more trouble than it's worth, so I retained the receiver RF amplifier. The SP5AHT circuit used a lot of coils that you had to wind, including in the audio stages. I economised on that by using a 10K to 2K transformer, with the 2K being centre tapped. 
that's not critical and you could use either a 3K to 3K or even 8 ohm to 1K provided the 1K side is centre tapped. With the 8 ohm though you might want to have another 8 ohm transformer to increase it up to 1K again. That's particularly important on receive. This inductor looks a bit complicated but all I did was I used a 4.7 microhenry RF choke which looks a lot like a fat resistor. 100 picofarad in parallel with that resonates on 7 MHz. As for the other coils, I used some thin enamelled copper wire. Four turns for the winding that goes to the balance modulator and product detector and three turns to the winding that goes to the transmit RF amplifier. The receive RF amplifier is tapped off the 4.7 microhenry via a 10 picofarad capacitor. Here's the driver and power amplifier stages. Just two transistors, but I could get around 400 milliwatts output. The first is a 2N222, and there's quite a few resistor values that you can hopefully read. The coil in the collector is eight turns on a bit of ferrite, such as a two-hole TV ferrite ballon, though you could use a toid like a T50-43. The main thing is it needs to be ferrite. The secondary winding is just three turns, and that provides some bias, that's a 1N4148 diode, and there's some DC supply here, into the base of the final transistor, which is a BD139. In its collector is another broadband transformer comprising eight turns of thin enameled copper wire by filer on a ferrite. It's round on either a two-hole TV ballon or an FT50-43 ferrite toroid. And finally we have the Pi network. Very simple, just two 390 picofarad capacitors and a 1 microhenry RF choke. With these ultra simple designs, often you're sacrificing one thing to reduce the parts count. In this case, the transmit receives switching. Normally, you're just switching DC power and the antenna. But in this case, we're also switching the input and output of the LM386 audio amplifier stage. That means that instead of a double pole double throw switch being suitable, you actually require a four pole double throw switch. You can buy them, although if you can't find them, you could just have two double pole double throw switches tied together. It does also mean that you don't have push to talk on your microphone, unless you're also to tether two double pole double throw relays, adding extra complexity. Here we'll just test the opposite sideband suppression. This is the lower sideband. So it's not perfect, but the wrong sideband is definitely greatly attenuated. This has been an interesting project. There's a few features I would have liked. For instance, a bit more output power and better transmit receive switching than just the switch on the front panel. It's more a novelty rig than anything else, but it still had some good contacts and shows that you can have a frequency agile SSB transceiver with a minimum of parts.